The 70s was part of a documentary series that was produced by Tom Hanks. Sometimes, when you live through a certain time period, you don't remember some of the things that happened during that time. Recently, I was re-watching this part of the series, and an episode called Crimes and Cults came on. I had forgotten that not only had crime been bad during the 1970s, but that it had been friggin' weird. It seemed like there were more weirdos and degenerates performing weird and disgusting crimes than any time in history. It was not only just the crime, but the nature of the crime. Cults, weird serial killers, and women that were trying to kill President Ford. I got to wondering what happened to all these people after they were caught or were not caught. The people whose crimes make you want to take a hundred showers. Did they change their lives? Are they still alive? Did they get paroled? Or did they die? What happened to them? I need to discuss what they did, of course, because I suspect that many of you weren't even a twinkle in your parents' eye during the 1970s. I decided to dig into all this stuff in a series of videos so that you don't have to. The late 1960s was supposed to be the era of peace and love, the hippies, and flower power. This was the time when we supposedly turned away from the materialism, racism, and unnecessary wars of the 1950s generation. That was supposed to be the general idea anyway. Two events seemed to put the nail in that coffin the Altamont Speedway Free Festival in December of 1969, and the Tate-LaBianca murders committed by the Manson family in August of 1969. At 5'2", Charles Manson didn't seem all that imposing. At least physically, he didn't seem like a guy who could convince people to murder for him. Even Manson prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi was surprised when he first met him. Born in Cincinnati, Ohio, Manson was the son of 15-year-old single mother Kathleen Maddox and Colonel Walter Henderson Scott. Not a real colonel, Scott was a con artist who vanished when he found out that Kathleen was pregnant. Maddox went on to marry William Manson before Charles Manson was born. Maddox would go out drinking with her brother Luther, leaving Manson alone with sitters. William Manson divorced Maddox after three years of marriage, citing neglect of marital duties. Kathleen and Luther were convicted of armed robbery and were sent to prison, and at that point, Manson was sent to live with an aunt in West Virginia. After her parole in 1942, Kathleen was reunited with Manson, but that didn't stop her heavy drinking. The family moved to Indianapolis, where Catherine met her next husband at an AA meeting. While he was growing up, Manson spent most of his time in and out of jail, as well as various reform schools and was often truant, spending his time committing petty crimes. He was sent to the Gabal School for Boys in Terre Haute, Indiana, at the age of 13, but didn't stay long. He ran away, but his mother sent him back, at which point he ran away again to Indianapolis. Manson continued to get into trouble, graduating from petty theft to armed robbery. After being released, he got married to Rosalie Willis and moved to Los Angeles, unfortunately in a stolen car, which is a federal crime, and landed him in prison. His wife gave birth to his first child, Charles Manson Jr., and then proceeded to divorce him. Charles Manson Jr. changed his name to Jay White, he committed suicide in 1993, leaving behind a son, Jason Freeman. Manson continued to run afoul of the law, which now included sex trafficking, and by 1967 had spent 32 years in various reform schools and prisons, mostly because of federal crimes. He had gotten married a second time to Leona Ray Musser, who went by her professional name of Candy Stevens, and fathered a second son, Charles Luther Manson. They would subsequently divorce, and Charles Luther would later change his name to J. Charles Warner. In 
In 1967, after getting out of jail, Manson moved to Berkeley, California. He had a talent for manipulating people and used it to prey on people's weaknesses, targeting those who were emotionally weak and social outcasts, which is how he formed his family. His first family member was Mary Brunner, a library assistant working at Cal Berkeley, followed by Lynette Squeaky Fromm. By the time they moved to Haight-Ashbury, there were 18 women living with Manson in Brunner's apartment. I'll have more on the principal family members later in the video. While living in the Haight, Manson took LSD and established himself as a guru during what was known at the time as the Summer of Love. In 1968, Manson and his followers moved from Brunner's apartment to the Spawn Movie Ranch in exchange for free labor. The Manson family ended up with about 24 people in it. In his book, Helter Skelter, Vincent Bugliosi theorizes that out of his 24 followers, he specifically chose those members who he knew had the capacity to kill. On July 31, 1969, 34-year-old music teacher Gary Hinman was stabbed to death in Malibu by musician Bobby Boussoulet, his friend and former roommate. Hinman's ear was sliced off with a sword by Manson, and Political Piggy was written on the living room wall in Hinman's blood. Hinman had become acquainted with Manson family members and had let them stay in his home, as he had other homeless hippies. This murder supposedly revolved around a bad drug deal and money that Hinman had inherited that Hinman claimed he didn't have. On Saturday, August the 9th, 1969, four members of the Manson family, Charles Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian, went to the home of actress Sharon Tate and director Roman Polanski at 10050 Cielo Drive in Los Angeles. Watson, Atkins, and Krenwinkel entered the house while Kasabian waited in the car. Three of the victims, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, her boyfriend, Wojtek Frykowski, and hairdresser Jay Sebring were visiting Tate at the time. Polanski was in Europe. 18-year-old Stephen Parent, who was visiting the house caretaker Will Garretson, was shot in his car by Tex Watson. Watson, Atkins, and Krenwinkel then entered the house. Watson claimed that Manson instructed them to commit the murders and make them as gruesome as you can. Sharon Tate, eight months pregnant at the time, was stabbed 16 times. The estate's housekeeper, Winifred Chapman, found the bodies when she arrived to start her workday. The word pig was written on the white farmhouse door. The next day, on Sunday, August the 10th, 1969, at 3301 Waverly Drive in Los Angeles, Leno and Rosemary LaBianca were the next victims. Unlike the Tate murders, Manson entered the house along with Tex Watson and proceeded to tie up Leno and Rosemary LaBianca. Manson then left the house and sent in Leslie Van Houten and Patricia Krenwinkel to join Watson with instructions to kill them. Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Steve Clem Grogan remained in the car. Watson stabbed Leno LaBianca and Krenwinkel and Van Houten stabbed Rosemary LaBianca 41 times. Krenwinkel stabbed Leno in the abdomen with a carving fork. The word war was carved in Leno's abdomen. The words rise and death to pigs were written on the living room wall in Leno's blood. Helter Skelter was written on the refrigerator door. Showing more than a little cheat after the murders, the three actually took a shower and raided the refrigerator before they left. The next day, Rosemary LaBianca's children, Susan and Frank, discover the bodies. When Bobby Boussoulet was picked up by the police, he had been driving a car that belonged to Gary Hinman. There was blood on his shirt and trousers, and a knife was also found in the car. On April 18, 1970, 
Fusilier pled guilty to the murder of Gary Hinman and was sentenced to death. After the death penalty in California was deemed unconstitutional by the California Supreme Court, his sentence was commuted to life. Susan Atkins pled guilty to the Henson murder and was sentenced to life in prison. The trial of Charles Manson started in July 1970, along with co-defendants Leslie Van Houten, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Tex Watson. It lasted 22 weeks. The defense presented no evidence and rested their case, not wanting to put the women on the stand as they were afraid that they would absolve Manson of all responsibility for his part in the murders. In January 1971, Manson and his co-defendants were found guilty of first-degree murder. In March, they were sentenced to death, but their sentences were commuted to life when the California Supreme Court ruled the death penalty unconstitutional. Tex Watson went on trial in August 1971. He was tried separately from Manson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten, even though, as in the Manson trial, Vince Bugliosi was the prosecutor. On October 12, 1971, Watson was found guilty of seven counts of first-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. He was sentenced to death, which was also commuted to life after the California Supreme Court decision on the death penalty. In 1972, Bruce Davis was convicted of the murders of Gary Hinman and stuntman and spawn ranch ham Donald Shorty Shea, conspiracy to commit murder and armed robbery. He was sentenced to life in prison. In December 1971, Clem Grogan was convicted of the murder of stuntman and spawn ranch hand Donald Shorty Shea and was sentenced to life in prison. The trials lasted nine and a half months, costing over one million dollars. Keep in mind that this was in 1970 dollars. It was one of the most publicized trials in U.S. history. People have often wondered about the motive in the Tate killings. One theory is that Manson wanted to seek revenge on music producer Terry Melcher. Manson had met Melcher through Dennis Wilson, one of the Beach Boys. Wilson promised Manson time at his studio. During the studio session, Melcher was present and was dismayed that Manson wouldn't take direction or suggestions from him or Wilson. Melcher agreed to visit the Spawn Ranch where the family was staying, but after listening to Manson's music at the ranch, he wasn't impressed and gave him 50 bucks and left. When Melcher didn't follow up, Manson became upset and went to his house. He found that Melcher had moved out and that the house was now occupied by Sharon Tate and Rowan Polanski. Manson, in several jailhouse interviews, claimed that the reason for the murders at the Cielo Drive house was because of Melcher's broken promise. There was no indication any promise was ever made. As for the LaBiancas, their house was next door to Harold True, a person they knew. They had partied with True in the past. Manson chose the house next door to True's home, which was Leno and Rosemary LaBianca's house. He had no connection to the LaBiancas, so the choice seemed random. Once the California Supreme Court ruled the death penalty unconstitutional, Manson was transferred from death row to Folsom Prison Maximum Security Center in Northern California. During his incarceration, Manson gave several interviews. He wasn't exactly a model prisoner. He lost his inmate privileges because of his hostile attitude. Prison officials deemed it dangerous to put him in the main population because one of the victims was a pregnant woman. In the eyes of inmates, the same thing as a child molester. In D.A. Bugliosi's opinion, Manson would always be looking over his shoulder for an inmate to attack him. He's been threatened by other inmates, so he never ventured far from his cell. During his incarceration, Manson had paint thinner thrown on him, then was set on fire by Jan Holmstrom, who was serving a life sentence for murdering his father. Manson received second and third degree burns over 20% of his body. Holmstrom claimed that God told him to kill Manson. 
After receiving medical treatment for his burns, he was put in a protective housing unit at California State Prison. Manson continued to be a disciplinary problem, being caught trafficking drugs in 1997 and unauthorized use of a cell phone in 2009. He also recorded an album of pop songs. Manson died on November 19, 2017 of cardiac arrest resulting from his battle with colon cancer. He was 83 years old. In all, Manson had 12 parole hearings, most of which he didn't attend. So, what happened to the rest of the Manson family? Leslie Van Houten grew up in Los Angeles, California, and at the age of 14, got into drugs after her parents' divorce. She was popular in high school and was a prom queen. She began to get into the hippie lifestyle and dropped out of high school and ran away from home. She returned to finish high school and at age 17 became pregnant. Her mother forced her to have an abortion and she never forgave her. In 1968, she met Charles Manson at a commune, began taking LSD, and joined the Manson family in 1968. Van Houten phoned her mother to say that she was going to drop out of college and that she would not be hearing from her. Van Houten was convicted of murder in 1971 and has renounced the Manson family. While incarcerated, she married fellow prisoner William Sivan in 1982 and ended the marriage two months later. She's been known to be a model prisoner, has earned a bachelor's and master's degrees, and runs self-help groups for prisoners. She's been up for parole many times and was recommended for parole in 2016, 2021, and 2022. These recommendations were blocked by Governors Jerry Brown and Gavin Newsom. She was incarcerated at the California Institute for Women in Corona, California. In 2023, the California Court of Appeals overturned Governor Gavin Newsom's denial of parole and Van Houten was released from prison on July 11, 2023, after serving a total of 53 years in prison. She will spend the next year in a transitional living facility. Charles Tex Watson, known as Manson's right-hand man, was the man who carried out the Tate and LaBianca murders. Watson grew up in Dallas, Texas, and worked as a Braniff Airlines baggage handler while attending North Texas State in Denton, Texas. He ended up in California after visiting a college friend and moved there permanently in 1967. One day, Watson picked up a hitchhiker, who happened to be beach boy Dennis Wilson. Through Wilson, he became acquainted with Charles Manson and joined Manson's followers. Originally sentenced to death in 1971, he is now serving a life sentence at Mule Creek State Prison in Lone, California. He converted to Christianity and became an ordained minister in 1981 and went on to earn a B.S. in business management in 2009. He married in 1979 and fathered four children via conjugal visits divorcing in 2003. California has subsequently gotten rid of conjugal visits for violent felons, the change in prison policy being spearheaded by Doris Tate, the mother of Sharon Tate. Watson has been denied parole over 17 times and has been in jail for 52 years. He remains incarcerated at Richard Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego, California. Susan Atkins grew up in San Jose, California. Her mother died when she was 15 and her father became an alcoholic. She and her brother were then abandoned by her father. In 1967, she was raising her little brother and attending high school in Los Banos and working as a waitress. She dropped out of high school in her junior year and moved to San Francisco, where she worked as a stripper. It was there she met Charles Manson when he was playing a guitar at the house where she was living with some friends. 
She then joined his commune and moved to Spahn Ranch, and while living there, gave birth to a son. When she was arrested, the child was taken from her and put up for adoption, as her family wouldn't assume responsibility for him. Atkins was sentenced to death in 1971, and in 1972 her sentence was changed to life because of the change in California law prohibiting the death penalty. She renounced Manson and in 1981 married Donald Lee Brazier, who claimed to be a millionaire. She had the marriage annulled when she discovered that he not only was not a millionaire, but had been married 35 times already. In 1987, she married James Whitehouse, her attorney, for her parole hearings in 2000 and 2005. She was diagnosed with brain cancer in 2008, and her request for compassionate release was denied. She and Whitehouse remained married until her death in 2009. Linda Kasabian grew up in New England, dropped out of high school, and then drifted around the country. She married twice and had a baby girl, Tanya, with her second husband, Robert Kasabian. It was Robert who would lead Linda to Los Angeles, inviting her to come live with him following a brief split during which she had gone to live with her mother in New Hampshire. Together, she and Robert lived in the hippie communes of Topanga Canyon. After Robert left Linda behind to go on a trip to South America, she became friends with Catherine Scher, who invited her to join the Manson Commune at Spawn Ranch. Kasabian quickly became a part of the group and often accompanied the Manson family members on what Manson called creepy crawls, in which they would break into homes and loot them while the owners slept. Because Kasabian was the only family member with a driver's license, her function was to drive the family members to the murder sites. Kasabian and her daughter left the Manson family and returned to New Hampshire. She later turned herself in and agreed to testify against the others in exchange for immunity, becoming the prosecution's key witness. After the trial, Kasabian tried to live a quiet life with her children, rarely appearing in interviews. When she did, she used a disguise. Kasabian died on January 21, 2023 in Tacoma, Washington. She was 73 years old. Patricia Krenwinkel grew up in Los Angeles, the daughter of an insurance salesman and a stay-at-home mom. She was bullied in high school because of her weight and a hormonal condition that caused her to grow excess body hair. In 1967, she was living with her sister in Manhattan Beach when she met Charles Manson at the home of a friend. Krenwinkel abandoned her car in a parking lot, left two paychecks at the insurance office where she worked, and at age 19, disappeared. A week later, she sent her father a letter which said, For the very first time in my life, I have found inner contentment and inner peace. I love you very much. Take good care of yourself. She joined Manson's commune, traveling with him and becoming a follower. In 1971, she was sentenced to death, which was changed to life in 1972, when the California Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty was unconstitutional. At the beginning of her sentence, she remained loyal to Manson, but has since distanced herself from him. She's been active in prison programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, as well as teaching illiterate prisoners how to read. She's been denied parole over 10 times. However, in May of 2022, her parole was granted but Governor Gavin Newsom reversed that decision, saying she would be a public safety risk. She remains incarcerated at the California Institute for Women in Chino. Mary Brunner was the first Manson follower and the first member of the family to have a child by Manson, named Valentine Michael Manson, after a character from the book Stranger in a Strange Land. Brunner grew up in Wisconsin and had a B.A. in history from the University of Wisconsin. She broke off her engagement to her fiancé and moved to California, 
where she rented a one-bedroom apartment. She met Manson by chance in Berkeley, California, while taking her dog for a walk. At the time, she was working as a library assistant at the University of California. The pair hit it off, and Manson moved into her apartment. He would later convince her to allow other women to move in, forming the Manson family. Later, Manson, Brunner, and the rest of his followers relocated to Spawn Ranch. Mary was arrested and imprisoned for armed robbery in 1971. She was with a group of Manson followers that attempted to hold up a supply store and steal guns. A silent alarm was triggered and a shootout with the police ensued. Brunner was arrested and sentenced to 20 years to life. She was paroled in 1977 and dropped out of sight. Now she would be 79 years old. Bobby Boussoulet, a musician, grew up in Santa Barbara, California. He got into trouble as a teenager and spent some time in Los Prietos Boys Camp. After his release, he drifted between Los Angeles and San Francisco, living with musician Gary Henman, who he would later stab to death over money owed in a drug deal in July of 1969. Boussoulet had bit parts in several movies, appearing in a soft, Porn film with Manson follower Catherine Scher. He also wrote some music, formed a band, and had his own family of women before Manson even did. Leslie Van Houten, Kitty Lutzinger, and Catherine Scher lived with Boussoulet before joining the Manson family. Boussoulet was convicted of Gary Hinman's murder in 1970, which was commuted to life in 1972 after the California Supreme Court ruled the death penalty unconstitutional. He's currently serving his sentence in the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. Boussoulet has been denied parole several times, and he's next eligible in 2025. He continues to make music in jail. He is now 75 years old. Lynette Squeaky Fromm was born in Santa Monica, California, the daughter of an aeronautical engineer and a stay-at-home mom. At some point, her father stopped talking to her, and all communication was done through her mother. When Fromm was in high school, her family moved to Redondo Beach, where Fromm began experimenting with drugs. After graduating from high school, she briefly enrolled in college, but dropped out after approximately two months. In 1967, after a family argument, her father kicked her out of the house, and she became homeless. She met Charles Manson when she was sitting on a curb crying, Manson asking her if her parents had kicked her out. Thinking he had amazing insight, she decided to join him and moved with him to the Spahn Ranch. While living at the ranch, the ranch's owner, George Spahn, began calling her Squeaky, due to the noises she was supposedly made when touched. Fromm didn't participate in any of the Manson murders, but she remained devoted to the family after their arrest. During the Manson trials, she camped outside the courthouse with other Manson followers, where they engaged in various stunts, such as carving the letter X on their foreheads as well as shaving their heads. After the trials, Fromm moved to Sacramento, where she and four others were arrested for the murders of James and Lauren Willett. The other four, including Aryan Brotherhood members Michael Morfort and James Craig, confessed, and Fromm was the only one of them to avoid charges. Fromm's luck ran out, and she finally found herself behind bars. On September 5, 1975, she pulled a gun and aimed it at President Gerald Ford, being quickly disarmed by a Secret Service agent. Fromm was arrested and convicted of the attempted assassination of a president and sentenced to life in prison. Like Manson, Fromm wasn't a model prisoner. She attacked another inmate at the Federal Correctional Institution in Dublin, California with a hammer and briefly escaped federal prison camp in Alderson, West Virginia in an attempt to reunite with Charles Manson. Fromm remained devoted to Manson even after his other followers had turned their backs on him. In 2009, at age 60, Fromm was paroled and subsequently relocated to a small town in New York. 
As of 2019, she was still in New York and living with ex-con Robert Waldner, whom she corresponded with while she was in prison. Sandra Good linked up with Manson in 1968 and lived with the family on Spawn Ranch. She didn't participate in the Tate LaBianca murders as she and Mary Brunner had been arrested on August the 8th for using stolen credit cards. Good claimed that her father, a San Diego stockbroker, had disowned her, but she neglected to mention that he had given her thousands of dollars and that Manson had threatened his life if he didn't give her more money. Good remained loyal to Manson for many years. In 1975, she and Manson follower Susan Murphy were arrested for sending nearly 200 hostile letters to various corporate executives. Good represented herself in court and was sentenced to 15 years, although she was paroled in 1985 after serving 10 of those years. After she was released, she continued to be devoted to Manson. Because she wasn't allowed to return to California as a condition of her parole, she moved to Vermont, living under an assumed name. When her parole ended, she moved to Hanford, California, to be closer to Manson, but she was denied visiting privileges. Good has been a loyal Manson supporter, periodically calling into talk shows to claim Manson's innocence. She has one son, Ivan Pugh, whose father is Bobby Boussoulet. Good is 79 years old. Bruce Davis was a former Scientologist from Louisiana who moved to California in 1962, immersing himself in the hippie culture. He wasn't involved in the LaBianca Tate murders, but was involved in the murders of musician Gary Hinman and Donald Shea, a ranch hand at the Spawn Ranch. Davis was convicted of those murders and sentenced to life in prison. He became a born-again Christian and earned a Ph.D. in religious philosophy. He spends his time working with other inmates. Although found suitable for parole in several parole hearings, each time the governor reversed that decision. In 2022, however, it was the parole board that denied him parole, citing lack of empathy. He is presently at San Quentin Prison in California. Now 80, Davis isn't scheduled for another parole hearing until 2025. Catherine Cher was born in 1942 in Paris to refugee parents. Her father was a Hungarian violinist, her mother a German Jew, and her parents were members of the French underground during World War II. Her parents committed suicide during World War II when Cher was two, and her maternal grandparents died in concentration camps. Before her parents' suicide, her father made arrangements with a French lawyer who was secretly helping the underground to plan his daughter's escape from France. Before Cher reached the United States, the American couple that adopted Cher divorced. They went to court, and her adoptive mother, Patricia Johnston, was awarded custody. Johnston later married American psychologist Sidney Cher, and he adopted her. The Shares relocated to Hollywood, California. Cher graduated from Hollywood High School in 1961. She maintains that her childhood was relatively happy, and like her biological father, she was a violinist. However, her mother was diagnosed with cancer and committed suicide when Cher was 16. Cher continued to live and care for her father, Sidney Cher, as he was blind. After he remarried, Cher dropped out of college, got married and divorced, and began wandering California, obtaining work in a number of movies. In 1967, Cher met Bobby Boussoulet on the set of a softcore porn movie entitled The Ramrodder. They began an affair, and after meeting Charles Manson through Boussoulet, she moved to Spawn Ranch. Cher was the oldest female member, and she recruited new members, including Linda Kasabian and Leslie Van Houten. Cher wasn't involved in the Tate LaBianca murders, but was convicted of witness intimidation during the 1970 Manson trial, for which she served 90 days in jail. 
In her 1970 testimony, Cher said that Linda Kasabian was the mastermind of the Tate LaBianca murders as she was trying to clear Manson of any involvement by fingering Kasabian. On December 18, 1970, Cher, along with Squeaky Fromm, Dennis Rice, Clem Grogan, and Ruth Ann Morehouse, were charged with attempted murder after they plotted to kill former fellow Manson family member Barbara Hoyt. They had wanted to prevent her from testifying for the prosecution against Manson, Atkins, Manhattan, and Krenwinkel. The charge was reduced to intimidation of a witness, and the group served 90 days in jail. After getting out of jail in 1971, Cher married Kenneth Como, and along with family members Mary Brunner, Dennis Rice, Charles Lovett, and Larry Bailey, held up a liquor store. They then drove a van to Hawthorne, California, Western Surplus Store, where they took 143 rifles and loaded them into the van. The store clerk tripped the silent alarm, alerting the police. When the police arrived, Cher fired on the police car hitting the windshield. Police returned fire, which wounded Brunner, Cher, and Bailey, and all five were arrested. In addition, they alleged that they planned to hijack a Boeing 747 and threatened to kill one passenger each hour until Manson and fellow family members were released from prison. Cher was convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to prison and was sent to the California Institution for Women. Following her release from prison in 1975, Cher didn't stay out of trouble. In 1979, she was convicted for running a credit card scam and fled to Canada, but voluntarily returned to the United States to serve her sentence. Cher finally turned away from Manson and divorced Como in 1981. In July 2006, Cher returned to the Spawn Ranch to be interviewed for the series Our Generation about her role in the Manson family. She has since been a public speaker, advocating against cults, and has developed a relationship with her son, Phoenix. She has written a book, She Was a Gypsy Woman, about her life in the Manson family. The rights were sold to Paramount, and the book was never released. Stephen Clem Grogan dropped out of Simi High School and started working odd jobs at the Spawn Ranch. The Manson family arrived at the ranch later, in 1968. Grogan didn't participate in the Tate or LaBianca murders, but did participate in the murder of Spawn, ranch hand, and movie stuntman Donald Shorty Shea in August of 1969. In 1971, Grogan was sentenced to death, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison. While in prison, he aided the police in finding Shea's remains. In 1985, he was paroled, making him one of the few Manson family members to be released from prison. He now lives in Northern California and works as a musician. Candace Bergen and her boyfriend, music producer Terry Melcher, rented the 10050 Cielo Drive residence in the early 1960s. When Melcher and Bergen broke up, Melcher moved out and moved to Malibu, and Roman Polanski and his wife Sharon Tate moved in. Rudy Altabelli, a music and film industry talent manager, was the actual owner of the house. He had purchased it in the early 1960s for $86,000 and rented it out to various people, which included Henry Fonda, Cary Grant, and Olivia Hussey. Unbelievably, Altobelli sued Polanski and Sharon Tate's estate for damages incurred to the property during the murders. Even though the court sided with the family, Altobelli was still awarded a small sum. After the murders, Altobelli had trouble selling the house. He couldn't lease it, so he moved in and lived there for 20 years. Finally, in 1988, the house was sold to real estate investor John Prell for $1.6 million. Prell owned it for two years and sold it to another real estate investor, Alvin Weintraub. 
The last resident of the house was the lead vocalist of the band Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor, who rented the house from Weitraub. Reznor set up a recording studio there and named it Pig, in reference to what Susan Atkins wrote on the front door of the house during the Tate murders. Nine Inch Nails recorded the album The Downward Spiral There, and Marilyn Manson also did some recording there. In 1993, Reznor moved out, saying that the history of the house got to him. It might have been the chance meeting that Reznor had with Sharon Tate's sister, where she asked him if he was cashing in on her sister's name by living in the house. That didn't stop Reznor from taking the front door with him and installing it at his new recording studio in New Orleans when he moved out. The door is now owned by New Orleans artist Christopher Moore, who bought it after the building was sold. After Reznor moved out, Weintraub later tried to sell the house but couldn't, so he bulldozed it in 1994. He then built an 18,000-square-foot Mediterranean-style mansion in its place, and changed the address to 10066 Cielo Drive. The house remained on the market until 1999, going through several price drops, until it was finally purchased in 2000 by Jeff Franken, the creator of Full House. The La Bianca house was sold multiple times after the murders. When it was on the market, the notes in the listing database warned agents to research the property's history. Real estate agents for the property said that when informed of the history of the house, most people backed off any kind of offer. The owners who purchased it in 1998 lived there for almost 20 years and finally sold it in 2019 to prepare for their retirement. Other than an address change from 3301 Waverly Drive to 3311 Waverly Drive, the house has been kept in its original condition and not leveled like the Polanski Tate House. In July 2019, it was sold to paranormal investigator Zach Bagans of Ghost Adventures for $1.98 million with the idea of shooting a movie there. In September 2020, Bagans changed his mind about using the house and put it on the market once again. It remained on the market for nine months before being purchased by an anonymous buyer for $1.875 million on June 15, 2021. The Los Angeles Sightseeing Company, Esoturic, gives a variety of true crime LA tours, and their website has a calendar with the tour schedule. One of them is called Manson Land, which was started in August of 2018, a year after Manson died. The tour gives different theories of Manson's motives for the Tate LaBianca killings. The first three Manson Land tours sold out. The website is still active, and there are pictures from previous tours. The Dearly Departed Tours gives a tour called Helter Skelter, which was still operating as of 2019. This tour concentrates more on a chronological retelling of the crimes by going to different relevant sites, such as Cielo and Waverly Drive, as well as where the bloody clothes were dumped, rather than formulating theories about motives for the murders. When I looked up their website, Dearly Departed Tours is listed as permanently closed. After wearing out their welcome at Dennis Wilson's cabin, the Manson family relocated to the Spahn Ranch during 1968 and 1969. At the time, there were 20 Manson family members in all. Spahn Ranch, otherwise known as the Spahn Movie Ranch, was a site for filming B-movies and for a few episodes of The Lone Ranger and Bonanza. As time passed and westerns became less popular, the ranch became more and more run down as income from the movie business dried up. The owner, 80-year-old George Spahn, had owned the ranch since 1948 and let the Manson family live on the ranch in exchange for free labor. At that point, the primary income produced by the ranch was a horse rental business that Spahn ran on the ranch. The women cooked and cleaned for Spahn and took care of him since he was blind. 
Squeaky became George Spahn's primary caretaker. Spahn lived in a small house near the entrance to the ranch. A man named Frank Retz, who owned the property adjacent to the ranch, tried to purchase the ranch at various times with dreams of establishing a resort complex for German Americans. He tried to achieve this by calling the police on the Manson family at various times to get them removed. After the Tate-LaBianca arrests, Spahn continued to live on the ranch with some of the women of the Manson family. However, in September of 1970, all the buildings at the ranch burned down in a California wildfire. After the fire, Spahn sold the land to an investment firm. Spahn was eventually admitted to the Sherwood Convalescent Hospital in Van Nuys, California, where he died on September 22, 1974, at the age of 85. He's buried at Eternal Valley Memorial Park in Los Angeles, California. Over the next 20 years after Spahn's death, the state of California began buying land for the creation of the Santa Susana Pass State Historic Park, which included some of Spahn's land. Wrights might have avoided being a Manson victim, but he wasn't so lucky when it came to a bridge that connected the former ranch, now a state park, with his property. In 1998, Wrights' car crashed into a ravine when a bridge collapsed that led to his home. The bridge had been red-tagged as dangerous. The jury was sequestered for 255 days. A number of them thought they would be paid by their employers, but they weren't. Some lost their jobs, such as one juror who had to quit her job to look after her daughter while her husband served on the jury. Another juror, Jean Roseland, claimed that her employer, TWA, didn't honor a verbal agreement to keep paying her salary, so she lost $2,500 in back pay. Now keep in mind that this is in 1970 dollars. One juror had her house burglarized twice during her lengthy absence. The husband of one juror volunteered to a reporter that his wife had started drinking a cocktail before dinner, which was something she had never done. The defense attorney, Irving Kanarek, implied that this juror was turning into an alcoholic and might not be fit to serve on the jury. Kanarek called the husband to testify, and he left town to avoid it, leaving his wife wondering why she couldn't reach him. The jury was kept under heavy security because of various death threats. Terry Melcher was a music producer who produced The Birds' first two albums, as well as most of the music of Paul Revere and the Raiders. He also produced several singles for the Beach Boys. Melcher was introduced to Beach Boy Dennis Wilson in 1968, which is how he met Charles Manson. The Manson family had been living in Wilson's house. Wilson expressed interest in Manson's music and also recorded two of Manson's songs with the Beach Boys. For a time, Melcher was interested in recording Manson's music and was present at a recording session that Dennis Wilson had arranged. Manson had trouble taking direction and Melcher refused to sign him, which upset Manson. Manson threatened Melcher, and he was so scared that he hid out for a while and hired a bodyguard. He had to be given anxiety medication before he could take the stand at the Manson trial. After the trial, Melcher continued to produce music for the Birds and served as a producer for his mother's show, The Doris Day Show. He received a Golden Globe nomination for the song Kokomo. He was married three times and had one son. Melcher died in 2004 from malignant melanoma. Dennis Wilson picked up two of the Manson family members when they were hitchhiking, one of them being Patricia Krenwinkel. The women told Manson of their meeting with Wilson and that they had talked about Manson's music. Manson and about 17 of the women went to Wilson's house and they stayed with him for a time, playing music and doing drugs. Seeing a deteriorating situation and unable to get rid of Manson and his followers, Wilson moved to a friend's apartment. After stealing most of Wilson's things, 
Manson and his family were evicted. Wilson claimed that Manson had threatened to kidnap his son and refused to testify at Manson's trial, instead being privately interviewed by D.A. Vincent Bugliosi. In the end, Wilson's testimony wasn't really needed. After the trial, Wilson continued to write songs for the Beach Boys. He also continued to abuse drugs, which included cocaine and heroin as well as alcohol. The band gave Wilson an ultimatum to admit himself to rehab or be banned from playing with the band. On December 28, 1983, Wilson drowned after drinking all day. He was married five times, twice to the same woman, and had four children. Hairdresser to the stars, Jay Sebring, owned a salon in Los Angeles called Sebring International. He was known to some of his clients as the Candy Man, as the salon's back room was used for dealing cocaine to the rich and famous. Sebring is buried in Michigan, where he grew up, with Steve McQueen giving the eulogy. After his death, Sebring's old Los Angeles salon on Fairfax Avenue was divided into two separate salons, and are now the Good Form Salon and Dan's Hair Salon. Both Leno and Rosemary LaBianca had children from previous marriages. Susan and Frank are the children from Rosemary's first marriage to Frank Struthers. Corina, Louise, and Anthony are Leno's children from his first marriage to Alice Schofield. Rosemary's children, Susan and Frank, along with Susan's boyfriend, Joe, found Leno's body. They fled and called the police. Leno LaBianca is buried in the family crypt, but Rosemary was cremated, her ashes scattered in Africa. Rosemary's daughter, Susan, and her boyfriend, Joe, cleaned out the house, including all of Leno's belongings, refusing to deal with his family. Leno had made arrangements for Susan and Frank to receive part of his life insurance, $20,000 each. Still, there was a battle over the La Bianca estate that went on for years. Susan eventually broke up with Joe, married and had children. She is now Susan LaBerge. She's been visiting Tex Watson in prison for the past 25 years, which according to her is due to Tex's deep faith in God. She has also attended some of his parole hearings. On July 3, 2020, LaBerge's daughter, Ariana Wolk, was stabbed to death by 24-year-old Jose Sandoval Romero in her Denver, Colorado apartment. She was 40 years old. Frank Struthers Jr. went to live with his father in Los Angeles, but his troubles continued. He worked as a cook, and alcoholism was a persistent problem. He was homeless off and on. He passed away on June 16, 2017. When she died, Sharon Tate was survived by her parents, Colonel Paul Tate, his wife Doris, and two sisters, Deborah and Patty. After Tate's death, Colonel Paul Tate retired from the military and seldom made any public comments, but did attend parole hearings with his wife. He also wrote letters to the authorities opposing parole. He died in May 2005. Doris Tate became an advocate for victims' rights, she campaigned against the parole of each of the Manson killers and worked closely with other victims of violent crime. She confronted Tex Watson and Susan Atkins several times at their parole hearings. In 1992, President George Bush recognized Doris Tate as one of his thousand points of light for her volunteer work on behalf of victims' rights. That would be her final public appearance. She died of a brain tumor in July of 1992. The Doris Tate Crime Victims Bureau was founded in 1992 in her honor. It's now known as the Crime Victims Alliance. After Doris Tate's death, her daughter Patty continued her mother's work with victims' rights. In 2000, Patty died of breast cancer and her sister Deborah continued to represent the Tate family at parole hearings. Deborah Tate has appeared at every one of the parole hearings since the Manson trials ended. After Leslie Van Houten's release on July 11, 2023, Deborah Tate gave an interview on ABC's Nightline, where she said, 
we're talking about one of the most murderous cults in America. Is it worth giving that a free pass? There are a lot of people that I would give a free pass, but these people are not amongst them. In the aftermath of his wife's killing, Roman Polanski was left with a bad impression of the press, who he felt blamed the victims in order to sell newspapers. His view was that he and the victims' families were victimized all over again. The murder of his wife wouldn't be the last of Polanski's problems. In 1977, Polanski was charged with drugging and raping a 13-year-old girl. In a plea bargain, he was charged with unlawful sex with a minor, with his sentence being time served. The judge rejected the plea deal after previously agreeing to it and planned to sentence him to prison. Finding out about this, Polanski didn't show up for sentencing and fled to France. After other women accused him of raping them when they were teenagers, Interpol put out an alert on him, so he rarely leaves France. In 1989, Polanski married French actress and singer Emmanuel Seigner. They have two children, a son and a daughter. On the 3rd of May, 2018, Polanski was removed from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences with the decision referencing the rape case. Since Tate's death, Roman Polanski has made some memorable films, such as Chinatown, Tess, and The Pianist. Unfortunately, this has been overshadowed by the Tate-LaBianca murders and his legal issues, as well as other accusers coming forward. Manson lead prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi was a deputy district attorney for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office from 1964 to 1972. He ran for district attorney twice but wasn't elected. In 1972, Bugliosi left the DA's office and went into private practice. He also became a writer, writing several books over the years, including Helter Skelter in 1974 which won the award for Best True Crime Novel of the Year. Bugliosi died of cancer in 2015 at age 80. Day Shin represented Susan Atkins in the Tate-LaBianca trial. The Manson trial was under a gag order, and Shin was caught passing a note from a spectator to Susan Atkins. The week before this, Manson followers were observed outside the courthouse reading court transcripts which had Shin's name on them. Married six times, Shin was behind on his alimony and house payments because of income loss during the trial. He was disbarred in 1992 because of a botched trial defense and died in 2006. When Irving Kennerick took the Manson case, he was known for his obstructionist tactics. In the Tate-LaBianca trial, Kennerick objected nine times during opening statements and was censured by Judge Charles Older. By the third day of the trial, he had objected more than 200 times. Kennerick practiced law in California until 1989 when a mental breakdown caused a suspension of his law license. He died in September of 2020 at age 100. Maxwell Keith defended Leslie Van Houten during the Manson trials. He received a fee from the county since he was court appointed, but said his private practice had suffered and he expected it to be hard to attract new clients because of the publicity. He died in 2012 at the age of 87. Paul Fitzgerald was a public defender and headed the defense team in the Manson trial. Fitzgerald first represented Charles Manson and then Patricia Krenwinkel. Fitzgerald lost $30,000 in income, incurring $10,000 in trial expenses, and was forced to sell some of his possessions. He died in 2001 at age 64. Defense attorney Ronald Hughes represented Leslie Van Houten 
and disappeared during the trial while on a camping trip. He was called the Hippie Lawyer because of his knowledge of the hippie subculture. His body was later found by a fisherman. Even though a Manson family member claimed Hughes had been murdered, his body was so decomposed that no cause of death could be determined. Stephen Kay, one of the Manson prosecutors, was only 27 years old and three years out of law school when he was assigned to the Charles Manson murder case. When Manson, Susan Atkins, Leslie Van Houten, and Patricia Krenwinkel went on trial in 1970, Kay joined the prosecution team after the original lead prosecutor was dismissed and Vincent Bugliosi took over. Kay received death threats during the trial and is still concerned that one of Manson's followers might carry them out. Kay has attended approximately 60 parole hearings over the years and has argued the killer should never be released. Kay spent 40 years in the prosecutor's office and is now retired. He still keeps in touch with Sharon Tate's sister, Deborah, having developed a close relationship to the family during trial and the many parole hearings. The Manson family was directly responsible for at least nine murders. Manson prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi believes that the family has killed more people than that and may account for some of the LAPD's open cases. According to Bugliosi, Manson bragged to Spawn Ranch hand Juan Flynn that he had committed 35 murders. It might have just been Manson bragging, but Bugliosi thinks that number could be possible. Susan Atkins told cellmate Virginia Graham that there were more, three of them buried in the desert. One of the three, Donald Shorty Shea, was found after Clem Grogan helped investigators find the remains buried on land next to the Spawn Ranch. At this point, who knows if any of the LAPD's open cases have any connection at all with the Charles Manson cult. I hope you enjoyed this video and got something out of it. The plan was for this video on Charles Manson to be the first in a series of 1970s videos on serial killers and cults. Little did I realize how much time this endeavor would really take. The next video planned is on cult leader Jim Jones, but I can't promise when I'll be finished with it. Remember to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell to help support my channel and be alerted to future videos.